So, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. As I was saying, so, so Tim was um, uh, on uh, uh, the main stage this morning on the, uh, over the hall, and we were talking a little bit about his technology at Solid and in Rut, and obviously um, how they are trying to build uh, products that don't leverage personal data. So, I guess my first question, I'm intrigued to get your sense of uh, how does being a privacy first company affect the way that you build products? Yeah, I think the main point about being privacy first is you can actually put user experience first, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to go to the sample of a Google product, uh, you know, today when you use one of Google's offerings, you're not really Google's user, right? What you are is the product that Google is selling to its real customer, which is the advertisers in many cases. And when you have that type of situation where there's a conflict of interest between the company and its actual users, uh, there will always be conflicts between, you know, um, do I make a feature that is better for user experience or better for the advertiser experience? And when push comes to shove, a lot of those times, I think those decisions will come down to who's paying the bills, mm. which in, you know, in the case of a company that is advertising based, uh, is going to be the advertiser. And I think uh, as a privacy first company, the approach that you can take is always putting users first, because actually users are paying you directly, they're paying you for the privacy. Uh, and because of that, uh, you are actually financially incentivized as well to you know, best serve the user. Yeah, and, and do you think though, to some degree, when we're thinking about that economic exchange, that to some degree, large technology companies have already trained billions of people to, the, to, to not really think about that, that transfer, to not mm -hmm. really kind of think that they're actually giving something up in order to uh, receive those services. Yeah. It's more not an issue of training, but probably what I call the disconnect between the virtual world and the real world, right? Uh, and the way to look at this is to imagine the real life version of Google. It's someone that follows you around, uh, monitors your every you know, move, it's recording everything you say, everybody you talk to has your whole agenda, and it's making a list of everything you buy, right? In the real world, you'd be terrified of this. You would never tolerate this. But somehow when it's happening online and it's invisible, uh, we seem to accept it. Yeah. And so it's not really, I think, an issue of that we have been trained to accept it. It's that we simply don't see it. And because we don't see it, we don't perceive it as being a big of an issue. Yeah. But it is just as big of an issue because actually our lives today are more or less moving online, right? Yes. You know, we are living more of our lives online than actually in the real world in many cases. Yeah. Uh, so it is a huge problem. And I think as the world becomes more digital, uh, we will begin to perceive this more and more. Okay. But um, I think to some degree, people are beginning to wake up. I'm interested, do you, I mean, obviously people, I mean, the, 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 the Proton user is clearly going to be using your products because they're motivated by the fact that you, you, know, you are privacy first. Um, do you think that more generally, consumers are more generally beginning to realize that there, there is this imbalance and they are giving up a lot? Mm -hmm. uh, the shift has for sure begun to happen. And the easiest way to see this is if you look at Apple, right? Or even Google or Facebook, some of these biggest companies in the world, all they talk about today is privacy. Mm. And when I first started in the industry back in 2014, this was only a couple of years after Mark Zuckerberg had his famous quote that you know privacy is long, no longer a social norm, right? Then a couple of years back, he comes out with his you know uh, Facebook post talking about how privacy is at the heart of everything that Facebook does. Uh, so the fact that you know <laughs> these companies have done a 180 degree you know turn on this issue shows that it is something that consumers care about. Now the tricky thing is when Facebook or Apple or Google for that matter say that they care about privacy. What do they actually mean, right? Mm. What does privacy mean uh, in the context of these companies? And I would argue that you know when Apple says uh, you know we're a privacy first company, we care about privacy, what they're really saying is nobody can abuse your data except for us, right? Uh, that's what Google really means when they say that you know they're privacy first, right? And the real definition of privacy is no one can abuse your data, period. Mm. So the risk that we run is if we let big tech companies move the goalposts for what privacy actually means, uh, then that's actually a, a more sure and faster way to lose privacy. Okay, that, 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 that's true. But I also think that like, um, let, let's talk a little bit about the fact that you know, Google has this enormous infrastructure. They've got mm. thousands of engineers. Why would anyone choose Pro, uh, Proton over Google that has this enormous kind of compute resource and all uh -huh. these. Yeah. Well, of course, it's a resource challenge 
for any company, any startup company, you know, anybody that came and challenged an incumbent had to fight against somebody with more resources, more technology, more money, uh, and also more time, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. Uh, you know, we have seen every company, like Tesla, for example, competing against a giant auto companies uh, manage to succeed. So uh, talent is for sure an issue, resources for, for sure an issue. Uh, we're helped in this regard because today, as technology gets better, what used to take 100 engineers can be done today maybe in three or four, maybe yeah. 10, right? Uh, but it's not just a competition for resources. It is also what I believe a competition for values, right? And if you imagine Google or Facebook's uh, vision of the internet and what that means for all of you, the way that they want to commoditize you and your data uh, versus Proton's vision of the future of the internet, where you know, your data belongs to you and privacy is protected uh, you know, by default and it's a really user first, people first vision. I would say that the vast majority of consumers out there probably are more in line with our vision of how the web should evolve as opposed to you know, big tech's vision. And consumers are in a capitalist society actually the most powerful market force. So it's a competition of values in addition to resources and I think the values in the long run can make that difference. Okay, that's interesting. So it's values based. So you think that privacy is enough, gives you enough in order to, in order to be able to scale? Uh, well, this is a, you know, I think uh, for in the personal journey, there was a couple steps, right? First was to understand, do people pay for privacy in the first place? Mm. Uh, and you know, when I started off in 2014, uh, VCs would say, so wait a minute, uh, your business plan is to compete against the world's largest tech company and <laughs> offer as a paid service something they gave away for free. And we're supposed to invest in that, <laughs> right? Uh, so that was kind of the perception of privacy in 2014. And I think by you know, growing Proton to be a profitable, sustainable uh, business, uh, you know, getting today to 70 million uh, you know, users have signed up uh, and 400 employees, Today, without actually you know um, VC money, uh, this is showing that not only is prof, you know, not we will pay for privacy, mm. uh, but I think it actually is a scalable business model, and it may actually even be more scalable than some of the Silicon Valley models that you know clearly just burn money and are not sustainable, right? Uh, and this is not to say that you know privacy will maybe be the biggest business in the world, but I think it should be uh, clear that there are alternative ways to do business online, uh, maybe more ethical ways to do business online uh, that also can work. And in the past couple of years, we have seen more and more companies entering the privacy space. And I think that's a very positive signal for mm. the, the space mm. and the ecosystem uh, overall. I want you to actually just to get a sense from the audience. Does anyone, who in here uses, I mean, who's got a Proton account or something? We're going to get hacked now in this room. Aren't we? <laughs> no, no. Um, so, so yeah, a fair proportion of the room, sort of about nearly 50%, I'd say. And it, it, you've, you've done this really interesting sort of um, uh, shift in the business recently. Obviously, you've had email. Uh, you now have the subscriptions uh, service with an encrypted calendar, file storage platform, VPN. Uh, T talk a little bit about how that sort of sh how that shifted. How, how's that going uh, in terms of like you mm -hmm. attracting new users? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, what I see in tech is we no longer are in the era of tech products, but actually tech ecosystems, right? And today, Google has an ecosystem, Apple has an ecosystem, Facebook's got one, uh, so does Microsoft. And I think privacy for it to actually go into mainstream audiences, so you know normal folks will be able to use it, uh, not just you know cybersecurity experts that we have here. Uh, you actually need to go to the ecosystem approach, because the average user today, you know, they don't need just email, right? They also need the calendar product, they also need the file storage product, they need the whole ecosystem that they're used to getting from the, their existing solutions. So I think the ecosystem approach is one way that lets us approach, let's say, the more um, you know uh, regular audience. And this is going to be key if privacy is to succeed and scale in the long term. Yeah. So Stephanie uh, was talking a little bit about this kind of like this idea, sort of like what what we want technology to be in kind of a, you know, a philosophical sense. And so uh, September this year, Proton, along with eleven other companies, signed a privacy pledge, five principles of a private internet. Can you walk us through that? Because I think it's super interesting. And, and, and just sort of like maybe if you can just explain why each of those pledges is what mm -hmm. you thought would be important, important elements. Yeah, this is a very cool initiative that we did together with companies like Mozilla, DuckDuckGo, Brave, you know, many other privacy companies. There are 11 companies that have started it, but it's expanded uh, you know, since then, right? Yeah. And the five principles are really around, you know, number one, transparency. Uh, number two, encryption. Uh, number three, data minimization. Uh, also very in, uh, important is uh, interoperability, because yeah. I think systems need to be interoperable. Uh, and these four principles really lead to the fifth principle, which is people first, right? 
and the motivation behind this initiative is we think, of course, you know, uh, big tech has this vision uh, for the internet. Uh, they are pushing their view of privacy. And as privacy companies, I think it's actually quite important to stand together mm -hmm. and put a statement together of what privacy actually means, mm -hmm. uh, what the real definition should be. Uh, so we cannot, so we don't let you know these big companies move the goalposts. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's a website on Privacy Pledge. You can read more about it. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's something I'm very encouraged to see. So many companies, you know, recently <laughs> come forward and decide to sign that pledge. Uh, and it's uh, something that, in the long run, will hopefully lead to a better internet for consumers around the world. So the same month. Um, India passed a law that requires companies uh, to store uh, user data, uh, sorry, that, that require VPN, uh, VPNs in India to collect user data. Yeah. You responded by pulling your servers, uh, physical servers, from the country. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Well, it's again a question of values, right? Uh, the law that India had put in place simply wasn't compatible with the values of privacy. And you know, we will never, as a business, uh, make a decision or choose to comply with something that forces us to actively conduct surveillance on our own users. And sometimes this will mean you know, lost business opportunities. For example, um, despite how lucrative the China market might be, uh, it's simply not compatible with our values to be there. Right? Yeah. Uh, and this is an example of that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, China's an interesting example, right? So obviously, India, China, mandating greater uh, location uh, data, uh, sorry, location data collection. Do, do you think we're moving towards the era, we've been talking about it for a while now, but uh, are we moving ever closer to the, 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 the splinter net that we've been discussing? Uh, unfortunately, I think we're already there, actually. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think when China put in the Great Firewall, uh, and this is not something new, they've been doing this since you know the early 2000s, yeah. um, we move in that direction. Uh, if you look at uh, what Russia is doing, you know, really, they even had an experiment before the war to test disconnecting from the global internet, right? Yeah. So in many ways, we've already arrived at this internet, uh, which is maybe a bit slow to admit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think you're probably right there. Um, we, we, we haven't got a huge amount of more time, but I think there's a lot of interesting ground to cover. Um, so I'd love to go and just push on for a little bit. Um, so, so Tim this morning talked a little bit about the way that um, Inrupt and, and, and Solid are working mm -hmm. uh, with the EU. And Proton recently lent its support to two antitrust uh, uh, pieces of uh, legislation in the US Congress. C can you just talk a little bit about that? Why, why, why did you feel yeah. that you, you wanted to get involved in that, that antitrust action? Yeah, people find it a bit weird that a privacy company is talking about antitrust, right? But what we've realized in the past couple of years is the easiest and most efficient way to solve the privacy problem is actually through competition. And the example of this maybe is uh, Facebook, right? I, I already picked on Facebook, but this is a good example, actually. You know, um, let's say you don't like uh, Meta's privacy policies and the way that they do business. Um, what are your options? You know, are you going to ditch Instagram for TikTok? That is you know, arguably even worse. Uh, you don't have any options, right? And that's the essence of the problem. Uh, if there were, let's say, five or six players in there, then actually Facebook would be forced to compete on privacy, which is something that consumers probably do care about. Uh, so I believe strongly that more competition, uh, you know, being able to have other companies in the space, is what will actually push tech companies to be more responsible when it comes to privacy policies. So, so regulators aren't doing enough, in your opinion, uh, at the moment? I think if you look at the numbers, the market dominance, uh, you know, the fact that these companies have a seven trillion market cap combined, yeah. the fact that they have almost 100% control over mobile platforms, uh, clearly all the indicators show that regulators have been asleep at the wheel for the past two decades. Uh, strong statement, but uh, I think there probably be a lot of people in the room who, who uh, would, uh, would, would agree with that. Um, so we heard Ian speak earlier. Obviously, national security, we mm -hmm. are facing you know, enormous headwinds. There are really significant geopolitical challenges we face at the moment. How do you think about balancing consumer privacy, privacy for individuals, mm -hmm. with the very, very keen sort of national security challenges that we face? Yeah. Well, I think this conversation often is very heated, right? People say, oh, you're enabling terrorists, right? Or some people say, oh, you know, we must have privacy. And for me, the key element here is to maybe realize that actually national security and privacy are not actually opposing forces many times. I think they're oftentimes you know, uh, two sides of the same coin, right? If you look at what ProtonMail uses with end-to-end -end encryption, uh, this is something that actually protects user data because it means that the data is encrypted in a way that you can't steal it from us, right? And that, in fact, uh, helps you know, guard against many of the cyber threats that are quite frequent these days and increasing. And 
those, and you know, I think cybersecurity is also a national security issue. So in many ways, I think you know, privacy and security can work together and are complementary. And not always, you know, we don't always have to think about them as opposing forces. My well, final question. Do you think that there is a risk that privacy, you know, we talked about you know, Apple earlier on, and yeah. you have strong opinions on that. But, um, is there a risk that privacy is becoming something that really is only afforded by wealthy nations, mm. wealthy customers? Uh, that can afford to collect, you know, to buy the devices or the, the, the ecosystems that collect less data mm -hmm. and subscribe to privacy first um, yeah. services like yours? Yeah. Well, I may have a maybe a more interesting answer to this question, right? If you look at the existing ecosystem, I would argue that it's already not good for the developing world. And example is, you know, what is kind of a, let's say, a big tech business model? It is to go into a developing nation. Uh, extract a high value resource, in this case, uh, data, yeah. uh, and then turn it into a high value you know, uh, product that they're um, gonna then use to extract most of the value from. Uh, this, if you think about it, looks a lot like colonialism and mercantilism from you know, uh, two centuries ago, right? This is just a digital version of it. Uh, so the inequality already does exist, uh, and uh, I don't think privacy will exacerbate that uh, you know, um, inequality. If anything, it could help be a resolution for that uh, by ensuring that actually you know, people have control of their data, and this is not a valuable commodity that is extracted and you know, misused. Uh, and you know, we're doing our part, of course, by offering our services for free. It's a freemium business model, and I think it's very important to do that and it's a bit reversed because in our situation it's the kind of wealthy first world countries who are paying users subsidizing the third world so in, in some sense it's actually a healthier model I think from to minimize inequality as well. well Andy thank you so much for joining us today and talking uh, about Proton and thank you for keeping my email safe as well thank you so much. Great Cheers. thank you. <laughs>